Yes, deck the halls and jingle bells. And yes, Santa Claus is coming to town. But let's not forget that this is a birthday party for Jesus, the Savior of the world. The most celebrated holiday the world over because the good news has been spreading ever since. Leaving aside much of the assumptions we mistake from the Christmas story. For example, like we even saw it in the video, the, the beautiful video clip at the beginning of the service. There's a lot of stuff we get wrong. For example, uh, we like to sing about the, th the three kings or the, the three wise men. Uh, more than likely, there were more than three. Most of the stories that we hear about usually put the wise men and the shepherds together at that manger scene. And actually, they're from two different stories. One in Luke, that's the shepherds on the night that Jesus was born. And then one in Matthew, where the magi come probably after Jesus is a couple years old. Or even like there's no room at the inn, right? <laughs> uh, even, even that, uh, quite frankly, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm bursting bubbles tonight, I know. But even that, originally in the Greek, that word is not really, should be translated in, it's really guest room. And, and Grace uh, read it in, in the NIV version, and it calls it a guest room. More than likely, it was, it was the guest room at the back of the house that, yeah, sometimes you would bring your animals into. Uh, as well uh, in, the, in the coldness of night. But leaving aside much of the assumptions we mistake about the Christmas story, I'd like to focus our attention tonight on two things that we all need. And it doesn't matter how old you are, I think we all need it from, from, from womb to tomb, if you will. And the two things that we need are joy and peace. Joy and peace. You know, I, I, I don't know who said it, but they said it this way. There's joy and wonder everywhere when you see the world through the eyes of a child. Joy and wonder everywhere. And I love this quote from G.K. Chesterton, that great English theologian and author, and he says this, Because children have abounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again, do it again, right? Every time I throw Joshua up in the air, my four-year-old, he says, do it again, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. That is true. <laughs> For grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony. Let me say that again. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough. It is possible that God says every morning to the sun, do it again, do it again. And to the moon every evening, do it again, do it again. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately but has never got tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy for we have sinned and grown old. And our father is younger than we. I like the way Ravi Zacharias put it, a Christian apologist. He says, God's infinitude can be manifested in a child's pr propensity to delight in the monotonous. Right? Again, do it again. Do it again. It's that, that, that innocence, that wonder that we all need. And let me, let me say this. It changes as we grow. An illustration that I, that I once heard, it, it, it's very, so I have four children, and, and, they're, and they're all different ages. Naomi, who's 14 now, Sam, who's 10, Isaiah, who's 6, and Joshua, who's 4. And for each one of them, it takes more to fill their heart with joy and wonder. So for example, like at night, they always want a story before they go to bed. I want a story before I go to bed. <laughs> but you know what? 
for my four-year-old. All I have to say is, once upon a time. And already he's like, I'm there. And then for my six-year-old, I got to get a little bit more into it. Once upon a time, there was a prince and, 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 and he lived in a big castle and then now his eyes get wide. And then for Sam, my 10-year-old, he's in fifth grade. And, you know, he's playing sports and basketball, you know, so, you know, he's learning about strategizing and, you know, it takes more to fill his heart with wonder. And so now, you know, there's got to be an element of danger and risk. Not only was there a prince in the castle, but maybe there was a damsel in distress or maybe there was uh, 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 an obstacle to overcome. And then now his eyes get wide. And then for my daughter, 14-year-old, goodness, I can't even make up stories anymore. <laughs> but even at that age, she still longs to have wonder in her heart. And maybe it, 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 it changes, but what I'm, what I'm trying to say, brothers and sisters and friends, is that as we get older, it takes more to fill our hearts with wonder and joy. And you know what? Jesus is the only thing big enough to fill your heart with wonder and joy. You know, when you look at this Christmas story, it is filled with wonder. I love it. There's nothing that can ever compare to it. Heaven is invading earth. Angels are appearing left and right. They're, you know, they're, they're, they appear to Zechariah, right? The father of John the Baptist. They appear to Mary. And again, you know, it, most scholars say she's probably not even older than, than 14, 15, or 16 years old. Peasant girl. Angel appears to her in this backwater town of Nazareth. Angel appears to Joseph, who is about to divorce her and, and put her away quietly because, hey, she's pregnant. Wonder. Heaven invades. Brothers and sisters and friends, I want to tell you tonight, you need wonder in your life. You need joy. I do too. And like I said, the only thing big enough is Jesus. The only thing big enough is Jesus. But you know, like we heard G.K. Chesterton say, we grow old, we sin and grow old. I love that. We lose that innocence, don't we? We know better now. I got an amen from the baby. There we go. <laughs> we know better. We've seen too much. We've seen the news. We've experienced loss, darkness, and despair. And that's why we desperately need peace. We desperately need peace, especially in these days. You know, the Advent candles and the, and the readings, you know, the, the whole idea is that Advent begins in darkness and despair. And I want to I wanna thank Victoria for lighting the candle. You know, it's funny, when I asked her to light the candle for me, she said, you know, that lighter always never works. Every time I've been here, it never works. And I said, don't worry, it's going to work. <laughs> you did a great job, Victoria. Thank you. You know, but when we light the candles... It's supposed to signify the coming of Christ, the light of Christ, the light of all mankind, the light of the world, the light that shines in the darkness that not even the darkness can overcome it, and it gets brighter and brighter and brighter. The light that shines in the darkness. Jesus is that light that we need. Jesus is the peace that we need, brothers and sisters. You know, for those of you that, that have been part of our Advent uh, series uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's been weird because this year we decided we would concentrate on the four last things. And the four last things are death, judgment, heaven, and hell. So if you were in church this Sunday, you got an earful about, oh, I'm sorry, H-E double hockey sticks. <laughs> but if we're honest, if we're honest with ourselves, yeah, there's a lot going on in the world. There's a lot going on in the world that, that tempts you and me. There is no peace. There's chaos. 
There's wars and rumors of wars. There's fighting. And maybe even within our own hearts, maybe within our own families, there's no peace. Can I encourage us tonight? Jesus is that Prince of Peace that you and I need and that the world needs. And just even as we heard that prophecy from Isaiah, the, 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 from the Jewish scriptures, the, 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 that, that scripture was, was given over like 600 years before the birth of Christ. Wonderful. There you go. Our need for wonder. Counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Those angels that night, when they announced good news of great joy, peace to all mankind on whom God's favors rests. Brothers and sisters and friends, Jesus illuminates our desire for wonder. And Jesus fulfills our longing for peace. And can I encourage you, you know, Jesus, when he comes, and this is another beautiful thing about the Christmas story, Jesus doesn't come with the big bang and the pomp and the circumstance and the flashy and drummed up stuff. Even the Magi, when they came, they, they, hey, who's the one born king of the Jews? They came to the capital city. They came to Jerusalem thinking that's where the newborn king would be. But no, Jesus comes lowly in a manger. By the way, manger means feeding trough. So there was, you know, there's no crib, no cradle, but a feeding trough. Jesus doesn't come with the flash and the lights and the glitter and the glitz. He doesn't come to those who are full of themselves and full of hatred and full of self-indulgence and greed, who have no room for humility and kindness. He doesn't come to those. But Jesus does come to the meek and the lowly, to the gentle, to those who will make room for a baby, to the poor, to the outcast, to the strangers and the foreigners, who even in the face of fear and doubt will bend the knee and dare to let their hearts be filled with awe that Jesus is the light of the world, the light of your world, the light of my world. He can fill that with wonder. He can fill that with peace. You know, I don't know about you, but as I get older, it, 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 I'm tempted to worry more. And again, like I said, it, it's, it's, it's that whole, we've, you know, lost innocence, lost the joy, lost the wonder, tempted to worry more. But can I encourage you tonight, brothers and sisters, if you will come tonight and worship Jesus, bend the knee, he will fill your heart with wonder and joy. You know, there's an old hymn that it's titled, Thou Didst Leave Thy Throne. Love the King James there, right? Thou didst leave thy throne and thy, and thy kingly crown. And, and, and it, the, the chorus goes to say this, Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room in my heart for thee. On this night, on this holy night, would you make room in your heart for Jesus? Would you make room in your heart? And you know what? Let's get rid of the other stuff. I don't know about you, but there's stuff in my heart that I'd like to get rid of. I'd like to get rid of that worry. I'd like to get rid of that disenchantment. and be surprised once again by the love of Christ. In closing, I, I want to quote a, an excerpt from this book I've been reading called The Jesus of Suburbia by Mike Ayer. Really, really good book. So if, if you're one who you know, likes to uh, combine reason and revelation together, this is a good book to read. But I like what he has to say. Listen to these words. The revolution of Jesus turned everything upside down. While kings were in their palaces and priests in their temples, the God King was born in a feeding trough. 
While the religious elite and wealthy slept unaware of the coming of the Christ, this news was announced to shepherds and foreigners. Instead of being born into a well-established and powerful family, Jesus' parents couldn't even stay with Joseph's family in Bethlehem, most likely because of the scandal of her pregnancy before their official marriage. This is how love invaded our planet. This is how the revolution began. It's unlikely, even absurd, but the last thing it should be is boring or predictable or explainable. This should incite passionate joy or passionate disdain. This is either the greatest thing ever to happen or the most ridiculous idea ever suggested, that God should come among us as one of the least of these. Not only did Jesus' birth turn everything upside down, so did his life and what he taught. You must die to live. You must lose to gain. Weakness is strength. Joy exists in the midst of suffering. Power is restraint. Love those who persecute you. Pray for those who hate you. Caesar isn't Lord, and Herod isn't king. It is not the strong or the wealthy who will inherit the earth, but the meek. The kingdom of God won't be given to the religious leaders, but to the spiritual dummies. I'm using a different word. The poor in spirit. Mourners, peacemakers, the merciful, and the persecuted can all find blessing in the kingdom of Jesus. Two kingdoms war on this earth. One is led by Herods and Caesars, the other by Jesus Christ. One is built on war, oppression, wealth, power, self-interest, and control. The other on love, faith, hope, freedom, grace, compassion, and truth. One demanded sacrifice, the other offered it in our place. The revolution of Jesus as embodied in the story of his birth demands our choice between these two kingdoms. Would you come and worship Jesus? Would you come tonight, make room in your heart for the King of Kings who was born this night?